Good morning. I'm Mark Arkenny, the Senior Manager for Government Initiatives with ActIAC, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on Intelligent Automation Technologies, sponsored by the Institute for Innovation. The Institute for Innovation within ActIAC works to highlight exciting over-the-horizon innovations within the private sector and in government. For more information about the Institute and our other work, please check out the website linked in the resource list. Today's webinar will feature a discussion revolving around how low-code and intelligent automation technologies, such as artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, allow federal agencies to meet many of the objectives set out in the President's management agenda. For those of you who have joined us in the past, thanks for your attendance again. And for those of you who are new, welcome. Our speakers for today's presentation are Jason Adolph, Industry Vice President, Global Public Sector at Appian, and Alexis Kane, Solutions Consultant with Appian. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you all to feel free to submit questions using the Q&A box on your screen. Our moderator, David Yang from ICF, will be curating questions for us at the end of the presentation. A special thanks to ICF for their assistance in producing today's webinar. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available for review in the coming days. With all that said, I'll turn it over to David Yang for a brief word. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I'm David Yang from ICF, and again, thank you all for joining today's webinar. If we can move to slide four on the screen, uh, as Mark said, this is a third webinar in a series we are promoting around the Presidential Management Agenda, or PMA, and the cross-agency priority or CAC goals that have been established to drive implementation of the PMA and tackle critical government-wide challenges that cut across agencies. For today's presentation, we are focusing on PMA Capital One, or IT modernization, and how low-code platforms and intelligent automation tools like Appian can help drive efficiencies while potentially reducing costs and enhancing citizen engagement and satisfaction. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jason Adolph, Industry Vice President for Global Public Sector at Appian, who will be leading the presentation. Jason? Thanks, David. I appreciate it, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak um, uh, with, with ICF and, and ACT IACT today. So um, I, I'm glad to have everybody on the call. We're going to go through um, a couple things today, and I'll, I'll walk you through the agenda here. So let me flip to my agenda slide. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. So one is how um, the, the, the PMA is relevant in today's where we are sitting today with, with everything that's going on in, in the environment that we're, we're all living in. We want to talk about um, what those relationships are between, you know, intelligent automation technologies and um, low code and how we can use those tools together to achieve some of the goals that are set out in the, in the PMA. Then we're going to talk specifically about um, three of the goal areas, some of the cross-cutting goal areas and how they relate up to um, data, IT modernization, and workforce. And, and then we're going to show you a little bit of a demonstration of how we can use low-code tools to actually um, orchestrate some of the other intelligent automation capabilities that exist in the market. So let's go ahead and, and, and get started. The first thing I think we, we all have to understand is that um, we look at low-code in, in this environment as a, as a risk mitigation for change. And what we're seeing more and more of in, across our customer base is that over the last couple of years, as, as the, the political environment has gotten um, a little bit more fierce, as um, change has been coming in organizations more rapidly, um, the ability to adapt using software to meet both policy and regulatory changes in a timely fashion um, has never been more uh, important. And what we're seeing is that we've gotten to this inflection point where policy and, and external forces are, are requiring agencies to change faster than the tools in their environment allow them to change. And so we, we want to think about how do, we, um, how do we take software and tools and allow those agencies to make those changes but do it in a way that, that um, is sustainable. And then when we think about it, we, we, we talk about how the, um, the management agenda is actually a good blueprint for doing that. And some of the, the key terminology that's laid out inside of 
um, of the PMA and some of the goals that are in there are actually designed to force agencies or to, to gently nudge agencies into um, into that posture where they can be reactive and they can make those adjustments and changes. And when we looked across, you know, especially the, the top three here, um, there's a number of areas where we're going to talk about how low-code tools and that flexibility that it provides um, actually allows an agency to meet many of these goals in a number of different areas and ways. And so when we tie all of these things together, we, we start looking at how those goals and some of the cross-cutting goals meet some of the primary goals, so CAPS 1 through 3. We're going to specifically talk today about CAP goals 4, 5, and 6 and how they kind of span um, the three major pillows uh, and, and how they can actually cut across those, those silos. So that's kind of the background of, of the conversation. Really, it is, um, you know, and we could have a, a discussion that would take, you know, many days to go through all of the goals and all of the objectives in the, in the president's management agenda. But I think we wanted to just highlight a couple of those areas and try and make the, make the connection. So one of the things that, that comes up very often, and, and we talk about um, code, low code, no code in, in this environment, I think it's important to understand what the difference is. And so we typically express low code and no code in, in kind of two different ways. No code tends to be more SaaS, software as a service offerings, where there is a kind of fixed way to do something, where there is some configuration capability, but essentially you are taking a template that somebody has created for an application and you're going to apply that template to your problem or your, your challenge. And when we look at low code, um, I think what we're doing is we're saying, yes, there are some things that are templated and there are some things that are cots, but we're essentially giving you a toolkit by which you can, you can find many different ways to solve many different challenges. And so, yes, a lot of low-code vendors provide um, out-of-the-box solutions or out-of-the-box accelerators. We do as well. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're kind of locked into that way of solving that particular agency challenge. And so if you want to look at the two of these kind of next to each other, there's no right or wrong answer. What I would say is that the, on the low-code side, you're providing more flexibility to your organization to meet various goals that you might have. Um, on the no-code side, um, there may be certain things where, um, you know, organizations do them very similarly. And so that's a good, uh, a good place to look for that type of technology. We tend to see a, a little bit of a blend in our product. So there's some aspects of the product that are what we consider low code. There are some aspects of the product that are no code involved. And so I think, again, when you're hearing this terminology throughout the industry, there's no right or wrong answer. It's really just semantics as to, um, whether you're dealing with a low-code platform or a no-code platform, there's no better or worse answer. So one of the things that we've pivoted on more recently in this environment is this idea of low-code automation and how what you really have now is a, a workforce that's got a different set of workers. It's not a replacement, but it's different. And so you think about it, a couple of years ago, there, was no, there were no digital workers. Everybody, every task from a workflow was, was delegated to a person. And so now what we're seeing is that work is, um, can be delegated to a lot of different things. It can be delegated to business rules. It can be delegated to an RPA bot or even an AI uh, a bot or an AI engine. And each kind of those workers has their own strengths. So humans are the smartest in that environment, but, but they're expensive. And and in many cases, they are slow, and in some cases, they can make errors. But, you know, and rules are great at automating decisions that have already been made by humans. So when we've got policies that can be codified into very specific business rules, that's, that's great. Um, RPA can perform very basic tasks quickly and reliably, but it doesn't handle exceptions or adapt to, to changes in environment very well. And AI, AI can be great also for specialized use cases translation, document understanding, things like that. But it's limited and it really only works best when it's trained with, with really huge amounts of data. And, and what we look at is because these workers are different, they're, they're better together uh, in this environment. And I think each of, these, each of these buckets does work that each of them can't. And what we see in the federal government is, and, that I, and I've seen across our, our entire global portfolio of government customers is that 
what we're trying to do, and we're, this is one of the topics today, is shifting from this low-value work to high-value work. And we're seeing the humans taking on more and more of a role in the high-value work and letting these other tools hand in what we would consider low-volume or repetitive task work in the environment. We'll, we'll show you some examples of how we do that. The other thing that I think we have to understand about low code is it's providing the orchestration and the flexibility to use other intelligent automation tools within the context of workflow. And so when we're thinking about a business process or an application, how does the low code um, tools, how do we provide that flexibility so that if an organization chooses um, one RPA vendor or one AI vendor, it doesn't mean that they're locked into that for eternity. And so one of the things we've really taken a position on is that in, an, in a given cabinet agency, there could be multiple bots or uh, bot vendors. There could be multiple AI solutions. There could be multiple emerging technologies. And so we're looking at this from a perspective of how do we use and, and how do we create integrations to allow our customers to be able to take what's best for the job, meaning, you know, in one case it might be something that Google does, in one case it might be something that some third party that's very specialized does, and allow them to coexist together in the same application environment. So we're looking at low code as, a, as an orchestration for um, business workflows, but also as a, a kind of coordinator for lots of different automation technologies within an environment. I'm not trying to lock into one or two specific vendors. Okay, so what I wanted, that was what I wanted to do kind of from a, from a setting up the environment. So let's talk specifically about how low code in many ways can address some of the customer experience challenges and improving the customer experience goals. So one of the first things that you'll see is that in the past with COTS tools, there tends to be a very fixed user interface. And so all of you have been through training on a COTS environment where you know, there's 100 different menu items and you spend two weeks getting trained on not touching 95 of the 100 menu items. So we've taken the approach that why not use low-code tools to build fit-for-purpose UIs so that the worker that is interacting with the service or the user, the end user that's interacting with the service, only sees the things that they need to see. And they're not having to create multiple UIs um, from scratch. We're just using business rules and using um, contextual groups to, to dynamically change these UIs so that we reduce the burden of training for those end users and ultimately increase adoption, meaning that in your environment, you may have a multi-tier contact center. And so you've got tier one caseworkers, tier two, and tier three. So why show them the same interface? Why not show the tier one person only what they need to see and then expand that for tier two and then expand that again for tier three? And all of that's possible within these low code environments. The other thing that we've that we're pretty that we that we see uh, as I think is a is a kind of a milestone in this um, uh, shift to improving customer service is bringing KPIs to the front end and, and to the to the end users that are delivering the service. So I come from a background of, of uh, outsourcing services to the government where we're doing you know providing the government with an outcome. And I think one of the things that we saw that was frankly, one of the more important concepts was when using, uh, in that case, in using Appian, we were able to bring metrics in real time right to the worker's desktop. And, and not necessarily in, in the government to grade them on their work, but when they saw how their performance was affecting the overall delivery of that service and affecting you know, the outcomes that were being delivered, we saw a performance bump. Um, you know, it's a kind of a classic gamification um, technique. And, and so I think one of the things that we think about when you're talking through low code and what it can provide is the ability to, to bring um, metrics, KPIs, things like that right to the forefront um, within an organization. The other thing we think about is within the concept of doing kind of a modernization, um, how we can use a low-code platform for a variety of different use cases within an organization. So we talk about delivering front-end services. Sure, you, you can take a low-code tool, and we've got a number of examples of this, where it is the uh, CRM application. It is what is exposed to the end user. It is what's exposed to the um, customer service agent that's, that's, that's servicing you know, a constituent. But we can also use low-code to enhance things that already exist in our environment. So 
most of our customers have external portals by which our you know services are delivered. Many of our customers have external or sorry third party systems that they're using to perform. Um, uh, you know, functions that are related to delivering that service. And so what you're seeing in this slide is we're illustrating how a low-code platform can be used in a number of different use case environments. It's not just a SaaS that only does one thing. I could use it in that environment where Appian is, you know, or a low-code tool is the system of record. I can use it where I might be extending the functionality of some ERP that exists in an environment. Or I could be using it as a system of systems. So where somebody is interacting with an Appian layer, um, and Appian is then interacting with multiple systems on the back end that's aggregating data into a single source of truth, and we'll talk about that here in a second. The other thing I think we'll see is when we talk about things like accountability. Um, so one of the things that we, uh, when I was doing service delivery, one of the things that was really important to us was being able to provide transparency into the business process for our end customer, which in this case was the government. And one of the ways we do that is by providing um, views into data that might exist in other places. So we have a feature in our product called Appian Records. Appian Records allows us to, to visualize um, a particular piece of data. So in this case, we might be visualizing a constituent. All of you work in organizations where um, you know, that view of the constituent may have data elements that exist in multiple places. And so instead of having the end constituent call into a, a service center and have the customer service agent have to look in five different places to find out everything that's related to um, that constituent, we're able to aggregate that data from multiple sources, display it in real time, and then allow that agent to take action against that piece of data. The difference is when we're done with it, we can also put it back into um, where it came from. So we're, what we're trying to do is provide that view to the CSR or provide that consolidated view to the end constituent while not creating another new data silo, meaning you don't have to pull all that data into an Appian repository in order to use it. And so what we've seen there is by one, um, you know, uh, allowing us to be able to show um, to, to, to bring all of that data into a single system, um, you know, it, it has the effect of approving the transparency into what is going on across an organization. I'm going to show you here a screenshot. So this is an example of, uh, you know, an Appian record screenshot. This is showing a, a actually a project record. And we could be pulling data from a number of different sources into that record. And what we're doing, though, is um, – whether I'm showing the customer or I'm showing somebody internal to an organization that's delivering something to an end user, um, all that information is is brought to the forefront into a single view of that of that UI or of that context. So again, in this case, it was a, a project. In the last case we discussed, it was in the context of a a constituent. But the idea here is um, when providing uh, when trying to uh, improve and enhance the customer experience, why not bring all of the data that's required in order to either complete the transaction um, or complete, uh, you know, the service request that's, that's sent in into a single view and thus reduce the amount of effort that somebody has to spend to deliver that particular output or that, that particular outcome. And so I think that's what we've been focusing on largely when we talk about improving customer service is how do we take all of the data, how do we take all of the metrics around that data, how do we expose that in a meaningful way such that we're setting expectations, we're improving transparency to the process, and we're allowing outcomes to occur, you know, faster than they might occur otherwise um, in, in a different environment. So I, I, can, I can also, you know, fold that into a lot of different, <laughs> we, could, we could certainly talk about this particular topic for, you know, hours on end, but I did want to get through to some of the other topics as well. So let's move on and talk a little bit about sharing, sharing quality services. So I think what we talk about here is we think about um, how do we look at service delivery across an organization. And so, you know, with, with what's happening now with coronavirus and, and, and certainly with uh, the, the methods that 
we've everyone's had to take to go to work remotely, to uh, you know spin up new applications, to modify applications, to handle um, some of the new use cases that have come out of of this environment. One of the things that we we've seen is that having a low code platform in an organization um, certainly allows for um, the rapid adaptation to that change, meaning I can spin up applications very quickly, I can modify applications very quickly, and what I'll show you over the next two slides is I can consolidate ca uh, capabilities very quickly to leverage investments we've already made within an, an IT environment. So one of the things that we'll talk through here is um, we understand that in, in you know, it would be, it would be um, uh, foolish for us to think that there aren't a lot of great tools that have already been installed in our customers' environments. So Tableau is a perfect example. Many of our customers use Tableau for business analytics, for uh, data consolidation in many ways, or transparency and, and accountability. And so what we're looking to do is say, all right, why make the worker that's performing the work um, go outside of, of where they're performing that work to use another capability that exists in an organization? How do we share the the how do we act as a conduit for sharing applications um, and consolidating application UIs into a single user interface that allows that worker, the end user, to interact with multiple tools at the same time? So just having a capability like Appian or like Tableau or like SharePoint or like Documentum or SAP in an environment, um, while that's great, what we don't also want to do is say, all right, to accomplish your task, you have to log into Appian and Tableau and SharePoint and SAP and every other tool to perform the work. So we've taken some strides to, you know, make it to, to develop this in such a way that allows us to pull those capabilities in and thus consolidate those capabilities into a single delivery environment. I'll show you another example. Um, uh, you know, th this idea of a shared workspace um, is why not, this is an example here, what we're showing of, of, of Documentum um, being pulled directly into an Appian UI. So again, why make our end user who's performing work inside you know, an Appian UI have to leave that UI to then perform the work inside of a tool like Documentum? Sorry, DocuSign. And so again, we're, we're trying to figure out how to use low code to orchestrate many of these capabilities, not just the intelligent automation capabilities, but other full enterprise class software directly inside of this kind of shared workspace that we're creating. So the other thing that we'll talk about here, and I'll, and I'll briefly touch on this, is you know, what, is, what are you actually buying when you buy a low code tool? Well, you're buying essentially a set of, of components that you're using to build applications. And so what you're seeing here is um, you know, th these are the components that make up the Appian platform. You're seeing across the top here that we've built some other applications. And, and so there's a number of benefits to that. One is I can complete, you know, build complete applications with the things that I have in my environment. So we're giving you all of the tools that are required to build a new system of record. We also understand that you may use other tools in your environment. And so with our product, one of the things that we do from a flexibility standpoint is allow you to substitute other tools for what normally would be Appian capabilities. So for example, uh, if you don't want to use our document management system, that's perfectly fine. You have SharePoint, you've got open text in your environment, great. Um, you want to use SharePoint on one application for document management and open text in another one, also great. And the nice thing is they all live within the same, that, that all of those applications can live alongside each other in the same set of shared infrastructure. There's no, we don't have to build another instance of Appian because one document management system is, is using SharePoint and another is using OpenText. We can build them alongside each other. And so that has a practical benefit of um, allowing applications to get deployed quicker. So most of our customers have you know, started with a mission system. They, they built something for the mission and they've gone off and built lots of other either mission applications or even some uh, back-end applications. And so that's facilitated in a lot of places, in a lot of ways, by using low code to form the, the basis of your platform APM. So we ATO the Appian platform that allows you to build applications with all of these tools. And then incrementally, if you want to introduce, um, if you want to introduce other 
products into that, you know, into that boundary, you're not having to re, uh, re-ATO the entire solution. You're just adding additional, you're just changing the boundary um, for that particular application. So one of the things that we've seen that really promotes speed and, repro- and, and um, promotes shared use across um, agencies uh, is this idea that once I'm at plat- ATO'd at the platform level, um, subsequent ATOs for new applications are very, very quick. And we've seen this in a number of our, uh, a number of our customers where they've gone from, you know, the first ATO, as you guys all know, can take, um, you know, your mileage may vary, but subsequent ATOs, the second one takes half the time, the third one takes half the time of that until you get to this point where, um, you know, you're going into production in, in 90 days, um, you know, you're going full into production in 90 days with, with development taking, you know, a matter of, of weeks. So I, I wanted to just highlight that as a benefit of, of the low-code environment and why you would do that in a kind of a shared environment where multiple parts of an organization using that shared infrastructure can, can really benefit from being able to build completely disparate applications, but, but from a technical perspective, be able to benefit from that shared ATO. So the rest of the slides are going to focus on this idea of shifting from low value to high value work. And, and this is one of the things where, so, you, you know, I, I came from a systems integrator that one of the uh, projects that we had was um, we were doing eligibility support for the Affordable Care Act in the early, and, and that's a project that, that goes on to this day. We had a workforce that was um, a service contract act for the vast majority of the workforce for service contract act employees. And so what you've seen, and when we started that in 2013, nobody was talking about RPA and AI. I mean, those were, those were very bleeding edge things at the time. And so what we've seen throughout um, the evolution of, of case management and, and low code applications themselves is, you know, the, the ability to use these types of tools to allow human workers or allow what were repetitive tasks to be shifted to um, automation technologies, but allow humans to deal with much more complex use cases. And and I'll give you kind of my my philosophy here, which is um, government programs don't get easier. They don't get more simple in, in the way that they operate. Government programs tend to get more complex over time as we layer on uh, more regulations, as we change policies, and that's kind of a fact of life. And in the, in the president's management agenda, you see this idea that how do we strip away a lot of that regulation and a lot of that redundancy, and that's going to take time. That doesn't happen overnight. And so the idea is where there are opportunities for taking um, what are happy path use cases, so Data comes in where we know what the rules are, we, we know how to adjudicate something, and allow RPA and AI and, and business rules to handle those use cases. What that does is allow our human workforce to handle stuff that we haven't seen before. And I can tell you when we did things like the, the Affordable Care Act, um, there were thousands of different combinations of use cases that came in every day where the policy may not have been, um, may not have expected that that combination. And we see that in, in everything. We see that in immigration. We see that in benefits determinations. And so one of the things that I'm very bullish on going forward is this concept, is this, con- is this concept of using, we, we call it full stack automation, meaning we're using case management and workflow plus AI plus RPA to deliver um, this, uh, this concept of moving from what is you know, having humans have to deal with every use case to humans dealing with the most complex use case. And the other, one of the things I see as a, as a really a, a big benefit of that is this idea that, um, that we uh, slowly improve our metrics by doing that, meaning that where uh, bots and, and AI can process stuff, you know, 24 hours a day, um, we can aver- actually lower the average processing time, uh, you know, across a, a range of, of applications or cases that are coming into an organization just by allowing the bots to do the easy stuff and then allow the humans to figure out the hard stuff. So I'll show you a couple examples here. So, you know, one of the things is to be able to do um, – to be able to look at reporting, but do actionable reporting. So where things are showing out of tolerance or where, um, you know, bots and in, in, in robots are, or, or AI tools are trying to do work and they can't. And we're bringing that, those use cases to the forefront to allow humans to handle those exceptions um, 
before they get to the point where they are, um, you know, passing a KPI or passing an SLA or breaking an SLA. We also do that through understanding by streamlining the processes. So by using low code tools, like you know, and we're a BPMN compliant um, uh, product, so the workflows that are being created, you know, are standards based. It allows us to take a look at um, processes over time and, and streamline them. Um, by streamlining those processes, we actually find places where um, automation can help. We also find places where um, there are opportunities to. Uh, drive work to the best possible person to do that work. And and because we're doing that in a standards-based way, you know, my feeling is that it, it certainly makes it, um, it allows us to do modeling and simulation based on the real output of business processes. So in, in my experience on the contractor side, we would actually take the data that was coming out of these um, these models and say, all right, well, if we made these tweaks, um, how would that actually affect output? And I think, you know, doing this, you know, in a process-based manner uh, and a standards-based approach allows us to do that. So the last couple of slides I have are going to focus on on kind of RPA, and this is getting into something very practical um, right before our, our demo. So, um, you know, RPA is is reached a very very big hype cycle, and and I think we have to understand that there's some differences here. Um, you know, RPA bots are not humans, and, and they're not going to replace human judgment or, or human the human's ability or authority to make decisions. And while we may be able to set up policies that allow for bots to do things that are black and white, um, that, that doesn't replace, again, human uh, judgment within processes. And so we look at RPA as a way to reduce administrivia. So how do I get rid of the stuff that just takes – um, repetition from a worker to allow them to focus higher up the feud team. And so what we've been focusing on at Appian has been how do I take what are tools like RPA and AI and bring them forward to the front end of an application? So it's, uh, let me show you how we do that. So one of the things that we've done is we've brought this idea of automation planning to the front end of applications. So instead of you logging into a, a Blue Prism or a UiPath or logging into some you know, model that uh, you've created in Google, um, we've taken um, this concept and said, let's let the low-code tools auto, you know, orchestrate that automation. And so what you're seeing here is a screen that is allowing us to plan when those things happen. And I'm going to show you some other examples of that here in a minute. This is an example of centralizing the request for doing automation. So I'm a business user, and I see an area for optimization. And so I can actually um, describe what I'm looking for. We've built um, – this is part of our, a product that we have called Robotic Workforce Manager. But I can actually go through a wizard that asks me some questions about what I'm trying to automate, and it will take me through the process of, of – um, not only me as the end user making the request, but the delivery team that might be working in, you know, UiPath or Blue Prism or Appian's RPA product, and shows them what I'm trying to accomplish and allowing them to build that automation. We also have this concept of a control center, and I'll show you two slides here, where um, we're providing insights. So as those automations are, are uh, you know, working through an organization, we've got bots that are being executed. We've got AI uh, determinations that are being made. We've got rules that are being fired. How do we show the end users what's actually occurring and what patterns are emerging from, um, uh, fr from that work? And so uh, one of the things that we see is when we see groupings of exceptions. So bots are attempting to, to um, handle cases. They start to spit out exceptions for certain cases they can't handle. And so we can use those bots in combination with some of the AI tools to actually tell an end user who doesn't have to log into some administrative uh, backend, what's occurring and where those bottlenecks are, are occurring so that we can suggest changes to fix them. You know, this is an example of somebody looking at um, what's actually happening um, in that environment. So one of the big things that we push is this, uh, this idea of accountability and um, auditability within an organization. So um, this idea that an end user, so I get audited, and, I, and somebody wants to know, you know, why a process was transacted as such, and I can go into the back end of my tool and actually see all of those automations that had fired, see anything that was done to a particular use case, 
and then provide that to some inspector or or um, uh, who's who's doing an audit on specific transactions. But the idea here, guys, and I'll show you one last slide before I turn it over to to Alexis. Is um, the idea, this is a, shy, uh, a slide that actually shows when automations are going to happen within an organization. So we've, we've actually allowed you to schedule bots to run from the front end of Appian. So I don't have to go into Blue Prism. I don't have to go into um, Google or Amazon or something like that to schedule it. We actually give you the ability to control that in a, in a friendly format directly from the front end of an application. So um, I'm going to kind of pause here, and I'll, and I'll kick over the slide while Alexis spins up. We'd love to collect, uh, connect with you guys on LinkedIn. Certainly, add us, um, you know, to continue these conversations. But this was a lightning round. This was 25 minutes of trying to connect the dots um, between automation and and a couple of the goals within the PMA. We, we could certainly talk about this topic ad nauseum for 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 a, a tremendous amount of time. Um, but what I want to do is, um, is is turn it over to Alexis, and we're going to show you some of these things live. So, Alexis, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Jason, I appreciate it. Um, so what we're gonna do is actually spend the next 15 minutes or so and talk to you all and show you all what exactly low code for intelligent automation sort of looks like here in this demonstration. So we're gonna walk through a Appian artificial intelligence utilizing our sort of new feature, intelligent document processing that was just recently released in the 20.1 version of Appian, and then we're actually going to show you an Appian robotic process automation bot running in real time here from the front end that is going to scrape a DUNS number from the web page and then come and check and make sure that the actual vendor is a legitimate vendor on SAM.gov. And then lastly, we'll just wrap up and show you what this looks like from the process model and how simplistic and low code Basically, um, it is for configuring this in the back end. So starting on this screen, we're sort of enact sort of our intelligent automation, our Appian artificial intelligence, whatever it may be. You can see that this particular application that we're on has to deal with purchase requests, which is just a straightforward process that allows for this creation, approval, and award of purchase requests internally here for our, for our company, whatever it may be. We have some high-level reporting down below that is just looking at acquisition summary reports by type, domain over time, so on and so forth. Once I'm ready to actually go ahead and drill down into a specific purchase request, this is the screen that I get right here. You can see that currently we are looking at a overview page of a purchase request for new laptops here. Right now I'm actually on the invoices tab, but if we wanted to toggle over to, let's say the summary view, we get a general overview of where along the workflow this currently lies, as well as just high level details on this particular purchase request, any documentation that has to deal with it, and any of that sort of cross collaboration that may have gone on during this workflow status here in the collaboration section. What I'm gonna do is actually go back here into this invoices section. And what we're gonna be redirected to is this invoice tab page where we're actually able to go ahead and upload any types of invoices, receipts that may come through for this particular purchase request. Oftentimes this is a type of compliance that needs to happen um, sort of to cross reference to make sure that whatever was purchased for this particular um, request at hand is legitimate. So if that's the case, what I can do is come up here and let's say I wanna upload a document, I wanna upload an invoice for this new laptop's request. I can click upload and right here, this is going to redirect me to a page that is going to kick off Appian intelligent document processing. And what we can do is we can pre-classify this document. So with intelligent document processing, we have four to three about um, out of the box different document types that are already configured for you. Um, those range from a claim to an invoice to a purchase order, whatever it may be. But let's say we wanna upload a document that we don't wanna classify here. If that's the case, what we can do is just come here to our upload section, select the uh, sort of PDF document that we'd want to upload, hit start processing, and then what we'll be redirected to is again, that summary overview page of just an overview of that data and that information that was just recently submitted. 
So let me take a step back and sort of talk to you all about what we just did there. You can see that right here, my invoice PDF that I just uploaded on May 21st has come in. We already have an auto classification confidence of about 97%. 0.4%, and it already it already just based off the document was able to classify it right off the bat. Now, with intelligent document processing, Appian AI, the idea is that companies need to extract the significant data from documents, from forms, whether it be invoices, receipts. And currently, the way that a lot of workforces do it is two options. It's very slow. It's labor intensive. There's a lot of manual entry that's extremely outdated. And it's hard to customize here. So with Appy and AI, we're sort of alleviating and mitigating those two grievances and pain points. So what you can do is automatically come in here, upload the document, and what we're utilizing is Google Auto ML natural language processing to classify the document, and then Google Cloud AI to actually extract the document contents for you. I'll show you what this looks like when we come over here into classify and reconcile the invoices. But what basically we mean by coming in and having the capability to reconcile is, let's say there is some human intervention that needs to occur. A lot of the times um, when it comes to artificial intelligence, optimal character recognition, whatever it may be, a human still needs to come in here and reconcile to make sure that all the data, all the information matches up with what is currently being extracted from the document. So this does take a minute to kind of come in and be able to reconcile. But what we currently see is a task that has just come in today at 1140 to come in and reconcile this PDF document. Once I come into this task, what I have is that overview of the invoice that I have just uploaded here and all of the document information that I was able to extract here. It even was able to pick up the invoice number. And when I click into the actual box here that corresponds with the invoice number, you'll see in the actual PDF document viewer page on the right-hand side, it's showing us intuitively where exactly it was picking up that data from the form. In the event that this data doesn't match up, what I can do is just simply come back in here, click on whatever the document contents are, and then that'll auto-populate here into the supplier, for example. So there is still some human intervention that sort of reconciliation step that can be performed here, but it's just an example of this intelligent document processing, again, of having the capability to reconcile and document extract some of these invoices. We can also do this in bulk as well. If you have a variety of different documents that you want to come in, upload here, we have that capability to do that document extraction, utilizing those partnerships with Google to sort of um, take that information and then reconcile it here for you in the future stage. Once I come here, click Reconcile, this document has now been approved. That data has now been sent back to our database, and we are good to move along the process. One last thing that I also want to show you from the front end is actual an actual example of Appian robotic process automation. So I'm going to switch gears here and actually go into this particular tab here, which is just an overview page of a vendor that we are currently dealing with in our system. We just want to have an overview of all the details that relate to this particular vendor, some different contact information, as well as the current customer location as well. Now, before I show you the actual example of Appian RPA in this instance, I just want to talk to you about what exactly do we mean by robotic process automation. So this feature is within the Appian platform. And again, it's utilized and its main goal is for automating these tasks using this using automation tools. And what we noticed before sort of in for integrating this within our platform is cost of labor has been increasing and businesses find that investments really in automating these tasks through software is a lot more attractive. So the cost savings for really outsourcing this work isn't as compelling as the cost savings for um, these sort of solutions here at hand. So what, we are, what we're ending up seeing is to free up your workforce and to focus on those tasks and initiatives that require this higher level of sort of cognitive thinking, you need to rely on robotic process automation to do some of those human mundane tasks that otherwise are taking that time and sort of making it a little bit less of inefficient for your workforce here at hand. So with 
Appian RPA, we actually are able to take those cumbersome tasks here. We can ensure the data quality and consistency for compliance concerns as well when it comes to utilizing sort of an automation piece, and we, is, which is especially attractive here for the government who needs to keep up with sort of those compliance concerns, right? So for this particular RPA instance, um, what I'm going to show you is actually initiating an RPA check on SAM.gov. So we have this particular vendor here, Electra Utilities, who has a corresponding DUNS number with them. And what we're actually going to do is utilize um, this bot to take that DUNS number and then do that SAM.gov check to make sure it is, in fact, legitimate. So what I'm actually going to do is just minimize my screen so we can actually see the Google Chrome extension pop up. So I just clicked on this particular task. Shortly, what will end up happening is a Google Chrome browser will pop up. Promise, I'm not doing anything on my screen. What you'll currently see is a DUNS number being entered. Once we hit search, we are then able to make sure that there is a legitimate SAM.gov check here, and then follow through and basically come back here and check and see with this status check whether or not it actually worked and whether or not it basically was able to then make that check and sort of legitimate and make sure it was active as well. So let me just go back into what this actually looks like in the back end of Appian. So here's an example of what this process could look like within an Appian process model designer. So we just walked through the front end, we showed you what the intelligent document processing looks like as well as the Appian RPA piece of taking that DUNS number, making the search on SAM.gov and checking to make sure it was legitimate or not. And now what we're currently looking at is that back end piece of how this is actually configured. You can see that it's just a few simple steps of making sure that everything is in check and that basically everything is configured efficiently. When it comes to the Appian our, when it comes to the Appian process model and the Appian designer, what you'll see is it looks very similar to if you've ever used Microsoft Visio. We are in fact BPM 2.0 compliant. And what basically we mean by that is what you can do with a lot of the design objects and coming in here and configuring your own Appian process model is similar to some of those other BPM um, sort of tools and uh, nodes that you would find familiar in, let's say, a Microsoft Visio tool, for example. So what I'm going to do is just show you how easy it is. We can add in a swim lane here um, when you want to add another one, for example. And then what we can actually do is come into this node here, which is to invoke that vendor check, the RPA one that we just recently did. And if I just double click into it, it's as simple as just taking in the sort of setup here, which we're calling in the specific integration with the vendor check, passing in that data, those parameters that we need, and then configuring it here for it to seamlessly run whenever we need it to basically go ahead and execute for us. Keep in mind that when it comes to Appian RPA and a lot of these robotic processes, we do have the capability to schedule them. Let's say you want them to run on the weekend. Let's say you want them to run when no one is actually physically at their computer. We have the capability to do that as well where you can then schedule some of these different tasks that could occur out of work hours, for example, that you would just want to collect the data for afterwards when someone comes back to work. If we want to come in here, add in a new node, for example, we can come in here, look at some of these smart services components, for example, let's say we want to add in um, a new integration mode or a new integration node for that matter. What we can do is simply take that node from the left-hand side, drag and drop it here. And once we're connected to this line and we know that it's highlighted blue, we can drop it in. And now basically, once we come in here, configure all the data and the information with this particular component, hit save. This will be now accessible in real time for whoever comes into contact with this workflow. I also can come in here and actually look at an overview of that process that I have just kicked off here. Um, you can see that here it is at the top. So I can come back in here and look and see what happened, sort of all that data that I was able to collect. And again, get that general overview audit trail of all the times that this has been kicked off, the number of active tasks still available, for example, or the number of completed tasks too. So this concludes the back end and the front end demonstration of Appian. Again, what we really just went through was the 
capability to do that document text extraction with Appy and intelligent document processing, and then also utilizing the Appy and robotic process automation as well to do that SAM.gov vendor check and um, sort of take a human task like that or a cumbersome task like so out of the hands so that we can make it a little bit more efficient for your work. I'm going to turn it back over to David, who is going to sort of facilitate the Q&A section. Thanks, Alexis. Great presentation. Uh, so we have a few questions here. I'll just uh, recite them for you. We have a few on will this uh, um, webinar be recorded, and it will be. The link will be on the ACDIAC Innovation Institute webpage. I'm sure they'll send it out later. Uh, we have one here asking, is Zappian FedRamp? Yes, uh, we're, we are FedRamp. We've been uh, FedRamp since 2015, so we've been in this for quite a while. We offer um, both a FedRamp moderate cloud, and we also offer the ability to do a managed service for impact level four and above um, for some of our DOD customers and, and, and customers that need higher security levels. So, yes, we are, we are definitely FedRamp. Next question, is training required for end users to use an application built with a low-code platform? Ah, good question. Um, so one of the things we, we talked about in the, in the presentation that I did was this idea that um, we want to build fit-for-purpose user experiences. And that's kind of a, you know, wordy way of saying we want everybody to have a UI that looks good to, you know, that's right for them. And and so I, I think um, one of the things that we've tried to do, and so there's, let's take this in kind of two, um, let's take this in two places. Um, one is we want to make it walk-up accessible. So um, when it, it, somebody logs in, it should be readily apparent what they're supposed to do, whether that is to click a button to start a task, whether that is to drive through some kind of wizard, um, um, or, you know, what is the next thing that they're supposed to accomplish in there? And we also want to make it easy for them to navigate large volumes of data. The other thing that, that is, is important is, and we do this through the use of some, uh, we provide templates and user patterns for in our UX designer, is that um, we want Appian applications on the same platform to to resemble each other, meaning that if an organization starts building a lot of things on the platform, which most of our customers do, um, we want somebody to go from application A to application B and there to be a familiar look and feel so that when, uh, I, so now that I understand how to navigate things in Appian, it's intuitive where I should be clicking on the next application screen in order to be able to use it. So we, d we tend to design to reduce the training burden um, and, and I think, you know, using the, the Agile methodology and, and lots of user acceptance tests, um, you know, doing rapid sprints, I think that's one of the ways that we um, reduce the training burden. There's always going to be some training burden, but what we want to do is go from multi-day training to job aids, where I can literally hand somebody a PDF that says, you know, here's, uh, you know, here's a couple of, 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 you know, quick tips, and they can go off and perform their work. Great. The next one has two parts. Um, first part, clearly there is at least short and medium-term value to RPA implementations, but is there a long-term benefit? And the second part or comment is, isn't it just a Band-Aid on old processes and systems that should ultimately be refactored or replatformed? Okay. Uh, so there's a couple of ways to, to think through this, and this is a this is a philosophical question in many ways. So. Um, I, I think there are short, there are, it depends on what you de describe as short, medium, and long term. So the idea that um, automated bots will be performing work tasks for the future is probably a safe bet. Um, what those tasks look like, I think, is up for debate and, and what they actually will do. Um, but the but the virtual workforce is not going away. And so in the short and medium term, what we're seeing is we're seeing RPA bots to just automate data entry or automate, um, uh, you know, we have a customer that uses us to automate project closeouts, where it's just taking data from one system um, and typing that into multiple places to status something so that the human doesn't have to do that. Um, 
you know, we're also seeing RPA being used as a workaround for integration. So where there is some system that, you know, is green screen or COBOL and we can't uh, build some modern integration, we're using RPA in that manner truly as a Band-Aid. Um, now, the, the Band-Aid um, for old processes and systems, and whether they should be refactored or replatformed, you know, philosophically, sure, they should be, right? But uh, realistically, that's just not going to happen that fast for a lot of things. And so we have a lot of customers um, that have, um, you know, some ancient stuff. And that's not just in the government. That's all, all across our portfolio of, of Appian's customers. And the thought that some of those things will, uh, you know, go away in the short or medium term is, is, is not likely. And, and so until that happens, um, you know, the, the bots can play a very integral role in performing work relative to um, what are maybe old processes or, or inflexible processes might be a better way to describe it. So, so yeah, it, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but, but ultimately it's, it's, it's what, what is the time high horizon you actually believe is um, short, medium, and, and long. Great. Uh, next question, is the Appian platform HIPAA compliant, PCI, SOC 1, SOC 2? Uh, yes. So um, as part of our managed service, you, those are optional things that you can run. Um, we run an AWS, and um, well, specifically for HIPAA, in PCI there is a um, – uh, there's a, an add-on that allows you to do that in, in GovCloud um, to go to for PCI and HIPAA. Um, and yes, SOC 1 and SOC 2, we, we are compliant with those. We have those. Um, it's uh, appian.com forward slash trust. You can see all of the security certifications and things like that. Um, who, are, uh, who are some of Appian's customers today? What are they integrating with and how are they using Appian? That's a, that's a question that we could, <laughs> could do another whole webinar on. Um, I'll, I'll bucket it very quickly because I know we're running close to time. I, I think, you know, we have uh, customers that kind of span the gamut of, um, uh, of the, you know, government landscape. A lot of defense customers um, were very heavy in the regulatory space, so customers that are performing re regulatory functions. Um, you know, I, w the things that they would integrate to are broad. And... Uh, you know, that's everything from, you know, custom-built legacy applications, um, you know, legacy systems for, co you know, co uh, COBOL, green screens, where we're using RPA to integrate with those things. We do a lot of ERP integrations. Um, and then, again, again, it's just um, – and then, again, I think it's just some of the um, kind of standard COTS tools that exist in everybody's environment, SharePoint, Documentum, OpenText. You know, and, and all of the um, you know uh, various reporting platforms that that exist as well. So I, I think we, we tend to see one of everything uh, across our customer portfolio. Good. And the last question, uh, time time running out. How is Appian the tools like Appian supporting the COVID response? Uh, good. Um, so. Um, a couple things. So we, we were very quick to we, – we formed kind of an internal Tiger team. We built a, a COVID response app. So that was um, how do I uh, – for, for my current workforce, how do I look at, um, uh, you know, what the health and safety is of, the, of those people, allow them to do check-ins, a TIPA compliant. That uh, COVID app is actually free for anybody to use. You can go onto our website and, and, and uh, get access to that immediately. Um, more recently, we've built an application that is uh, designed to help organizations return to work safely. So um, it helps with the screening process. It helps with mobile check-ins. It helps with uh, understanding where employees are and, and how they come back into the organization. Um, and so that also is now available for our customers as well. Um, but we've, you know, we've done a number of things. So we've, one, we've built those, those applications that are available. And also, you know, for customers that are having um, to modify things rapidly um, that they're currently doing in the platform, we've also been there to assist them in, in making that happen as well. Great. Thank you, Jason and Alexis. That's all the time we have now for questions. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Mark. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to Appian for today's robust presentation. A friendly reminder that this webinar will be available on demand on 
the same platform and for your review as well on the Institute for Innovation website uh, on the ACTIAC page. Please stay tuned for more Institute webinars in the coming week. Thank you all for joining and we hope to engage with you again soon. Good morning. I'm Mark Harkenny, the Senior Manager for Government Initiatives with ACDIAC, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on Intelligent Automation Technologies, sponsored by the Institute for Innovation. The Institute for Innovation within ACDIAC works to highlight exciting over-the-horizon innovations within the private sector and in government. For more information about the Institute and our other work, please check out the website linked in the resource list. Today's webinar will feature a discussion revolving around how low-code and 